Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Zair Yunus and today we have a very special guest joining us to talk about um, the repercussions of the ongoing conspiracy theory and the political instability in Pakistan on Pakistan's foreign policy. Um, my guest needs no introduction. Her name is Dr. Malia Lodi. She has served as Pakistan's ambassador to the United Nations, to the United States, to the United Kingdom. Um, somebody who has deep experience uh, navigating Pakistan's foreign policy in a lot more challenging times than what they are today. And I figured that, you know, we would have a conversation with Dr. Lodi about uh, what's going on in Pakistan today, what she thinks about uh, this conspiracy theory, which, by the way, is not going away. Um, in fact, uh, just before starting the recording today, I was checking uh, social media and it turns out that the uh, Tariq and staff led by its uh, valiant uh, former minister, Shiri Mazari, is uh, tweeting out uh, October 2021 story by CNN insinuating that that's when the conspiracy began because Imran Khan said absolutely not. Um, so Dr. Lodi, first of all, welcome to Pakistanomy. Thank you for taking out the time. Um, and I would love to start with your perspective on what you think about uh, this ongoing saga related to regime change in Pakistan? Well, it's pretty evident from what we've heard from the military authorities, uh, as well as according to my own information, that uh, there was no, consp um, no foreign conspiracy uh, to oust the government of uh, Imran Khan. I think um, PTI has been using this uh, as an alibi to explain why it lost its parliamentary majority. Um, there is no shed of evidence to substantiate uh, the claim that uh, any foreign conspiracy was you know, responsible for the um, ouster. Uh, it was a constitutional process, a vote of no confidence was moved. Uh, the government of uh, PTI had lost its majority even though it lost it narrowly, but it was a minority government to start with. So I think uh, the recent uh, announcement now, I think by the government to set up an inquiry commission uh, is aimed at trying to end this uh, controversy because uh, Uzair, as you rightly say, uh, this narrative uh, is, uh, you know, it, it finds ready believers amongst the base uh, of uh, Imran Khan's party. Yeah, and, and one thing that stood out to me, and I would love your thoughts on this, is also like, you know, my view on this is you, you're you never going to be able to succeed to convince the base that there was no conspiracy here. And of course, people in Pakistan and around the world, given the nature of decentralized information networks, believe all sorts of conspiracy theories, right? I'm living in Washington, D.C., uh, where many people to this day continue to believe that there was some conspiracy against the Trump administration and the vote was rigged and you know the, the election was stolen back in 2020. And they continue to believe that despite any and all evidence. Um, it was visible, for example, also um, on the left uh, who continued to say that it was Russian interventions in, in 2016 that led to Donald Trump's victory, um, et cetera. And so what do you make of the fact that we have an inquiry committee being set up, but my view at least is that it's not going to have any impact. Do you really think that, you know, a, a commission report that says, hey, this actually did not happen is going to be, uh, you know, is going to find any level of credibility among the Tariq and Saf's leadership or its support base? Well, I think what we should remember is that the Tariq and Saf uh, base does not represent all of Pakistan. So the aim is to ensure, I think, uh, you know, to set up such a committee or an inquiry commission. I'm not sure what it's going to be called and what its composition is going to be. I mean, it's not as if everybody in Pakistan believes this, uh, as you said, and I agree, uh, it's just uh, the base or the supporters of PTI, and I, I'm sure not all of them, um, but, it is a way to at least bring these facts to light because at the end of the day, whether anybody believes it or not, facts do matter. Uh, we may be living in a post-truth world uh, thanks to demog demagogues uh, all over the world, with, you know, and you cited one of them, 
uh, the former US President Trump. And then we have a demagogue right in our region, um, Modi. Uh, and you know, their supporters do try to create alternate facts, as they call them, and they're not facts at all, uh, alternate reality. Uh, you know, and you know, there's a lot of self-delusion uh, involved in this game. So however uh, it turns out, uh, it is clear that the aim is to try to put the broader controversy uh, at rest so that the country moves on. I mean, I, you know, what surprises me is that uh, considering uh, the second meeting of the National Security Committee was very clear in saying, uh, the statement issued after that was very clear that, and this is the one that the fo former ambassador, Pakistan ambassador to the US actually attended. First meeting, he was not there, he wasn't called. So he gave his uh, account of what had happened. Uh, you know, so it's it's time for the country to move on. Yeah, I agree. It's it's time for the country to move on from this, and and maybe it'll take a few more weeks and months, uh, and and hopefully the the report that eventually comes out. We don't know the composition of this commission. Maria Morangzeb, the information minister, said that's coming soon. Um, but I want to look at things from a wider lens. You, of course, have served. Um, in the United States uh, during very challenging times for Pakistan. Uh, and, and you recently wrote a, a column, uh, which is a must read for the audience, is linked in the description below, um, talking about the fact that, you know, Pakistan does and has historically pursued an independent foreign policy at great cost uh, to its own people in the sense that, you know, you, you sort of uh, in, in the column talk about the nuclear program, the pressures related to it, the sanctions, et cetera. Um, and then of course, post 9-11, uh, there was a lot, uh, a lot more challenges as well. Um, is it really uncommon or is it this big of a deal for um, and a sitting ambassador to sit down for a lunch with somebody on, on the other side, whether it's in the United States or the United Kingdom or elsewhere, um, and for another diplomat to say, or to use undiplomatic language where essentially, you know, he's communicating or she's communicating that, hey, look, if, if things continue the way they do, our relationship is not going to strengthen, it's going to face volatility and turbulence. Um, is that is is what happened really out of the ordinary in terms of the way it's been reported even in, by independent journalists? I don't think uh, I can comment on that because I'm not privy uh, to that conversation, nor have I read the cable. Uh, so I don't think I'm in a position to say uh, that this was usual or unusual, um, you know, unless I have access uh, to the actual text um, that describes that meeting, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I, I'm not going to comment on that. Okay, so, so let's talk about from a wider lens then. In terms of the conspiracy, you know, I've spoken to some retired diplomats to get a sense of what they think about what the implications are, how Pakistan's diplomats engage abroad with, with interlocutors and have conversations. What do you think the repercussions are of this uh, cynical use, in my view, of, of a cable um, for domestic political gains? Like, does that have far-reaching impact on Pakistan's own foreign policy and its diplomats' ability to engage abroad? Or do you think this is, this is just something that is more domestic and doesn't really impact the country's foreign policy? No, I think in the short term, it does uh, mean that diplomats, uh, Pakistani, as well as those who are engaging with Pakistani diplomats will be that much more cautious uh, or careful because they won't be sure uh, whether their conversation will, you know, see, uh, you know, be sort of become public um, or become sort of controversial. So I think, yes, in the short term, it will have an impact, but I don't think uh, you know, I mean, remember uh, WikiLeaks, uh, which exposed or revealed, in fact, uh, many conversations that took place uh, between Pakistani and uh, American officials. I mean, that too uh, had an impact, I think, on both American as well as Pakistani diplomats uh, for some time. Uh, but then, you know, uh, you know, as, as I was saying before, you know, people move on. So I think in this case too, uh, there will be a short term. Uh, short-term damage, if I can use that word, um, to diplomacy and to the work of diplomats, uh, Pakistani diplomats. Uh, but I don't think it will be a lasting uh, effect or lasting damage. 
And and so obviously the the core focus is on the United States in terms of this conspiracy, and and that perhaps is a good segue into your perspective on the broader bilateral relationship between Pakistan and the United States. Of course, it has faced a lot of volatility in recent months, uh, particularly since the fall of Kabul. Um, but the relationship was not in a great place uh, to begin with, and it has faced ups and downs in the past as well. Um, what do you think are ways in which both sides, um, particularly the new administration in Pakistan, um, can find a way uh, to first stabilize and then secondly deepen or broaden uh, this relationship given the historical baggage that exists um, in the bilateral in the bilateral relations between the two countries? Well, it was there for a start, I think this coalition government um, has a very short lifespan. Uh, it wants to, you know, serve it out uh, till, you know, full term, as it were, of the assembly, um, which is a year plus. But nobody quite knows whether that would be politically possible. So, you know, a government with a short lifespan is not going to be able to take any major foreign policy initiative. So I think their main priority will be and should be uh, the economy. Uh, as you know, the economy is in deep trouble. Um, they need to take some tough decisions and they have to take them up front if we want the resumption of the IMF program, because on that is contingent, uh, the rollover of debt from several countries, bilateral debt. And I think um, the prime minister's recent visit to Saudi Arabia um, has also uh, in a way laid bare the need for Pakistan to have a fund program, because I believe the Saudis too would wish for Pakistan to resume the program before they can press ahead with any additional um, lending or additional uh, funding. So I think that is going to be the key. As far as the United States is concerned, I think, yes, um, you know, there is a process. I think it's already underway, uh, you know, in a very low key way uh, to mend relations uh, between the two countries. Um, but as I said, you know, I, I don't expect any major initiative on any front. I think the key countries that are going to be in focus are going to be the two strategic partners of Pakistan, China and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I believe the next visit, foreign visit of the prime minister will in fact be to China. So, I mean, I think if you look at the priorities, um, you know, post US exit from Afghanistan, uh, you know, Pakistan is very clear that it needs to be strengthening relationships uh, which are strategic in nature. Um, and that, uh, you know, a new normal that has to be established with Washington is going to be a very different one uh, from the kind of relationship that we've had post 9-11 or even in earlier phases. Um, and, you know, we can discuss that uh, in a bit. But I think priority-wise, for, on foreign policy, these countries are going to be the priority along with, you know, mending ties, at least, uh, you know, sort of calming down ruffled feathers uh, in terms of the Pakistan-US uh, relationship. But overwhelmingly, it is going to be the economy that will preoccupy this government. You mentioned Saudi Arabia, and perhaps I, I start from a regional perspective, and then we'll get back to the United States in just a moment. Um, of course, recently there has been an uptick in, in terror attacks within Pakistan. Um, I was reading a couple of weeks ago that the Interior Ministry had uh, told Parliament that um, Baloch and certain groups were regrouping uh, via Sistan in Iran. Um, and of course, the Saudi Iranian rivalry plays into the entire region. Um, and Pakistan is no stranger to it, right? And this government, and particularly PMLN, is no stranger to it, given the Yemen vote in Parliament and, and the impact in the short term that it had uh, on the Saudi-Pakistan relationship, or at least how the Saudis viewed Pakistan for the foreseeable future after that. Um, how does Pakistan navigate um, that, that tricky phase or balance that relationship, given the fact that Iran is a neighbor? Um, there have been historical issues related to Iran. Uh, but also with the United States, again, pursuing some level of uh, nuclear agreements uh, with Iran, the Saudis have expressed concern over there, over there as well. Um, so given the, the strategic nature of ties with Saudi Arabia, um, how do you see Pakistan navigating or balancing uh, the interests of its own neighbor, Iran, on the one hand, and its strategic partner, Saudi Arabia, on the other? 
Well, I think uh, it has become easier to balance relations between the two because what we are witnessing now uh, is engagement between the two countries as they try to not just manage tensions, but to reduce tensions uh, between them. So this uh, diplomatic opening between the two you know, major rivals uh, does provide diplomatic space uh, for Pakistan to have a, you know, to continue to have a good relationship with Saudi Arabia, but also uh, to have uh, a normal uh, relationship uh, with Iran. So I think, you know, we're, we're in a better place uh, right now compared to the past, uh, when the two countries' tensions uh, had, you know, reached a record high. Uh, that is not the case. So therefore, uh, Pakistan is able to do it. It has uh, recently, you know, a few months ago, uh, there have been exchanges between Iran and Pakistan, which, has, which have led to greater economic uh, ties between the two. There's a barter agreement uh, that uh, took place. So, you know, I think historically, as you rightly say, Uzair Pakistan has uh, balanced the two uh, relationships, one with the neighbor, the other with a strategic partner. So I think it'll continue uh, with this balancing act, but it's just, you know, the, the latest situation does make it somewhat easier uh, to continue doing this balancing act more effectively. And again, on the Saudi, and, and I think the Emiratis are in this, in this boat as well, we've been hearing of a Western Quad. I had an Indian guest a few months ago who, who talked at length about how India, the UAE, the United States, and Israel are exploring a Western Quad, more, more so on the technological economic side and less on the military side. But again, we've heard about the Emiratis investing in Indian occupied Kashmir. Um, you know, the Saudis looking at petrochemical investments in Maharashtra, in India, et cetera. Um, what, how do you see that part of the relationship impacting Pakistan? Because one thing I have been going around in my head with, and I think I view it as a risk in terms of Pakistan's own approach to the region, and you mentioned the economy as well, um, is that the chronic issues within Pakistan's own domestic economy means that strategic partners like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, including, um, view Pakistan more as a, you know, let's give them some aid, let's give them some loans and assistance to keep the economy afloat. But in terms of deepening strategic economic ties, we're going to look eastwards into India, perhaps even Bangladesh. And Pakistan really doesn't uh, feature as much in emerging Saudi economic uh, thinking uh, as perhaps I would think it should, um, mainly because of Pakistan's own shortcomings. Um, do you see that as a risk to Pakistan's own standing in the region, given the fact that you know India is deepening its ties with, with the Gulf uh, monarchies and, and the fact that an emerging leadership in Saudi Arabia doesn't see the opportunity in Pakistan as perhaps it should? No, I don't agree with that at all. I think uh, there is no zero sum view uh, in Pakistan. The Saudis and the UAE government have, uh, you know, they have a sovereign right to have relations with whichever country they wish, just like Pakistan does too. Um, you know, for example, Pakistan has very close uh, ties with Qatar. Um, and there were times when uh, relations between Qatar and the countries that you mentioned weren't exactly uh, in good in good stead. So, you know, countries follow their own interests. But I think what you have overlooked in your question is, is the fact that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is of course very keen to use economic power to expand his country's diplomatic clout by making strategic overseas investments, uh, had also, uh, you know, on his last visit to Pakistan a couple of years ago, uh, had uh, initiated a series uh, of uh, projects that he was interested in investing in. So I think there is an opportunity uh, for Pakistan uh, to take this forward. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, Pakistan needs to have a coherent strategy, economic strategy uh, in using its political ties with Riyadh to attract uh, Saudi investment, not just uh, in the areas that were identified uh, by uh, the Saudi government during his visit, but also uh, pointing them in other directions. So I don't, I don't think, you know, I mean, they're making investments in our neighborhood is not mutually exclusive. Uh, and I don't think Pakistan is, uh, you know, nervous about that. 
and and so sort of expanding into the the second strategic partner china um the jcc um has not met in over two years at this point obviously um there was a heinous terror attack um at the university of karachi killing three chinese nationals that has come on the back of the dasu attack and other attacks on cpec projects carried out across the country um, and of course, there is uh, near-term economic assistance required from, from China as well. Um, how do you see the relationship moving forward, given that it has, again, faced turbulence starting in 2018 with Razak Daoud's comments about CPEC, um, and then famously the army chief going to China to you know, alleviate some concerns. But we've had consistent reporting that SEZs are not moving forward as expected. There are payables on the power sector side that have not been cleared. Um, and to me, the fact that the JCC has not met in a number of months uh, is a major red flag. Um, what will it take to sort of you know, move this relationship forward, given the importance of CPEC, not just to Pakistan, but to China's own BRI ambitions as well? No, you're absolutely right, because uh, the uh, CPEC is uh, the pivot of China's Belt and Road Initiative, which you know, is the 21st century's most ambitious uh, economic enterprise. Uh, so, you know, it, the CPEC's timely progress uh, is crucial, uh, not just to reinforce uh, Beijing's interest, uh, but also uh, for Pakistan's uh, ability to make rapid uh, economic progress and, of course, to continue to keep ties with our strategic uh, allies in, uh, in, you know, in a good place. So close coordination is, is extremely important. But I think there seems to be some misinformation that CPEC has slowed down. CPEC is on track. I mean, I meet Ch Chinese diplomats all the time in Islamabad. I met uh, you know, the CDA only last week. Um, and, there, and I certainly did not get the impression uh, that there has been any problem or slowing down uh, in CPEC. It has now entered its second phase. Uh, and I think there are issues that need to be, of course, uh, uh, addressed. There always are. I mean, this is a huge, huge enterprise. Uh, so I think this government should be able to move to, for example, simplify cumbersome bureaucratic approval procedures for Chinese investors, um, you know, promote more business to business cooperation because China wants to see in the second phase of CPEC more private um, business to private business uh, interactions and cooperation. So I think, you know, this, this, I mean, let's not forget, this is Pakistan's most important bilateral relationship. And relations with China, strategic and economic, will remain its overriding priority. I think the one question that I'm sure will come to your mind, but let me try to also um, flag it, uh, is that, you know, one of the challenges uh, for Pakistan's foreign policy makers in the months and years to come would be how to navigate the uh, US-China um, standoff, if you like, or it's more than a standoff, I mean, it's a confrontation. Uh, so, you know, how does Pakistan sort of navigate that? Because uh, clearly uh, its strategic um, priority is China and not the United States, but it does want to have a good <clears throat> normal relationship uh, with the United States. But of course, we've entered a new phase uh, post, uh, you know, post Afghanistan in terms of the US uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, where the two countries would have to redefine uh, their relations and find more um, substantive bilateral content uh, to this relationship. So, you know, it has to navigate the Sino-US confrontation, but at the same time, try to see how it can best improve ties uh, with the United States, but without in any way getting sucked into this big power rivalry. Um, you know, and of course, you know, as long as uh, US-China relations remain unsteady, and they are unsteady right now, they do have a bearing on Pakistan's effort to reset ties with the US. Uh, because as you know very well, Uzair, uh, containing China is the top American priority. Yeah, it definitely is. And as the Biden administration, I think they, they call it a strategic competition uh, with China and the focus on the Quad and East Asia is evident in that. And I think in that mix, um, something that I've been looking at, uh, trying to understand a bit closely is 
the how Vietnam is navigating this, right? Because the Vietnamese have been very smart in terms of getting Chinese businesses to invest and modernize their economy from in terms of both domestic and export uh, productive capacity, while also maintaining ties with the United States, which is also interesting in its own way, given that Vietnam is also a communist country and the United States, um, you know, despite the rhetoric around open free and open Indo-Pacific democracy, etc., continues to have a deep relationship with the Vietnamese. Um, and the Vietnamese have balanced those two things uh, to their own benefit, right? Bangladesh, in a way, comes to mind because they have investment from India, China, Japan, Europe, United States, uh, including, um, but they balanced all of that. So perhaps there are some lessons uh, to be drawn upon and learned in terms of how to navigate that. But you preempted my question around the United States as well, because one of the things that, you know, when I talk to younger people, people who haven't served uh, or, or work during the heyday of the US-Pakistan relationship nine, post 9-11 or even before that, continue to ask, and I would love your thoughts on this as well, is what are the core strategic interests or mutual interests between the United States and Pakistan on which a new relationship uh, can be built? Um, because when I ask people about that, that, there's not a whole lot that comes to mind in terms of where this relationship goes next. And I would love your thoughts on what are these ingredients that perhaps we can, you know, bring together and cook up a new recipe for this important bilateral relationship uh, for both countries? Well, let me first say, before I come to the more positive side, but let me first say that clearly the Sino-US uh, confrontation or tensions uh, have an impact uh, on Pakistan's ability to you know, redefine its relations with the US because the US is so preoccupied by its contained China policy. And I think what also complicates uh, this desire to have a better relationship with the, the United States is Washington's uh, growing strategic uh, relations with India, its partner of choice in the region uh, in its strategy to project India as a counterweight to China. I mean, the implications for Pakistan of the US-India Antan are more than evident from Washington turning a blind eye uh, to the grim situation on, in occupied Kashmir. And of course, as you know very well, it's strengthening of India's military and strategic capabilities. So in fact, uh, closer US-India ties uh, are likely to intensify the strategic imbalance in the region, which will magnify uh, Pakistan's security challenge. So I think we have to keep this um, uh, sort of three-way uh, you know, relations also in view uh, when we try to sit down and say, uh, you know, what are the areas that the two countries can cooperate on? I think uh, you know, Pakistan's importance, uh, I think Pakistan's desire is that the relationship with the US should now be predica predicated on Pakistan's intrinsic importance and not as a you know, byproduct, if you like, of a third country, which is you know, Afghanistan. Uh, as you know, for almost two decades, Afghanistan was the principal basis for engagement in uh, our frequently turbulent ties, which were marked by both very close cooperation, but also mistrust. And it was mutual mistrust. So as we you know, try to turn a new page with the US, the challenge, as you rightly said, was to find a new basis um, for the relationship. And to find a new basis means that you know, we have to see how we can expand our trade ties. The United States uh, remains Pakistan's largest export market. Uh, so, you know, so there is the economic dimension. I think in uh, a lot of uh, global issues in multilateral bodies, since I had also served at the UN, I can tell you there are many areas uh, on which we can cooperate, um, you know, global issues uh, on which we can cooperate. And then, of course, there's a great deal of people-to-people -people contact, educational ties. So I think these are the kinds of areas uh, on which uh, the two countries can you know, try to engage and see how they can build a better relationship. But you know, a lot is contingent on Pakistan's ability to also stabilize its economy, to, to build a stronger export base, because when you seek to strengthen economic relations with uh, you know, a, a superpower, uh, then you need to also have a, a strong economy uh, that can help you really upgrade uh, your relationship. So, you know, 
so for me, uh, you know, or for anybody else, actually, uh, you know, foreign policy begins at home. Unless we are able to do many things at home, uh, you know, we, we can't really contemplate major sort of uh, turning points or improvements uh, in our relationship uh, with, you know, with, with, with the United States. Yeah, I would I would underscore your point on on foreign policy begins at home, both politically, but you know, in terms of economic interests as well. Because and I, I worked on projects where you know we would help investors identify countries for potential investment opportunities. And uh, one thing that I learned very quickly was that Pakistan, more often than not, sort of gets filtered out at the first or second hurdle uh, because of issues related to ease of doing business. Uh, cost of power, labor skilling, things like that, which means that if you are a big US company or a big European company or whatever investor country you may be from, um, barring strate a strategic push, it becomes very hard at the investment committee level to uh, make the case for Pakistan. And I think there's a lot that needs to be done at home to improve that. There's a whole lot of potential. And we've seen the potential translate into positive developments, for example, in the startup ecosystem, right, where the right type of decisions were made to make things easier for foreign investors. And we've seen exponential growth um, off of a low base, but still exponential growth. And that, that trend is continuing, right? So there are uh, mm -hmm. things that we need to do at home domestically as well. You mentioned um, something interesting that I would love your thoughts on. And, and given that you've served at the UN and it still is a debate, um, you know, India, including, is being pushed on taking a more clear stance on the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, my view personally ha was that and has been that Pakistan perhaps should have lent more towards the Ukrainian people and, and, and Ukraine as a country than it did primarily because we in our neighborhood um, are the smaller power compared to a more increasingly belligerent India on the other side. So the logic that Putin used to invade Ukraine could essentially, uh, you know, with a few changes used uh, to threaten Pakistan in 10, 15, 20 years or in some imaginary future, which therefore meant that Pakistan as a smaller country should have sided with the smaller country more openly. Um, do you think, uh, and again, I would love your thoughts on uh, whether you disagree with me vehemently uh, or not, um, how Pakistan should have or should continue to navigate this Russia-Ukraine conflict and the international multilateral forums? No, Uzair, I was a, a critic of the then government's policy uh, on Ukraine uh, for many of the reasons that you just marshaled out. Uh, I mean, we don't have uh, a strategic relationship uh, with Russia, nor did, do we have any, you know, any kind of relationship, frankly. Um, sh I mean, to be sure, we wanted to improve ties with Russia and, uh, you know, on Afghanistan, uh, as you know, the Troika Plus, uh, which had been on the diplomatic front very active prior to the Taliban's takeover, and it still it still meets. I mean, Russia is a member uh, of the Troika. Plus means, of course, Pakistan. That's China, Russia, United States. Uh, Troika plus. So, I mean, there have been. Why I'm citing that is there have been forums uh, on which Pakistan has been engaging with the Russians, but I think the invasion of Ukraine clearly. Uh, you know, was a major, major event. And invasion means that you have flouted international law and, in, and invaded another country, uh, which is a sovereign country. So I think uh, Pakistan should have been a little more upfront in, uh, you know, in describing what had happened the way it should have been described. But somehow uh, at that time, this desire uh, not to perhaps annoy uh, Russia uh, created an impression, even though Pakistan kept saying we're neutral, we're neutral, we're neutral, but somehow the impression that was conveyed, uh, especially since the then Prime Minister Imran Khan happened to be in Moscow uh, when Putin ordered, uh, or when the invasion of Ukraine actually took place, it gave the impression that Pakistan was somehow soft on Russia. Um, so I think uh, our army chief, General Bajwa, uh, tried to correct that impression by uh, his speech that I believe he made at the Islamabad the dialogue, uh, where he did uh, speak about the need for a ceasefire and the need for, you know, uh, to find a peaceful uh, solution. And he was quite clear in how he saw uh, the invasion. Uh, so, you know, that was trying to apply a corrective 
uh, to a policy that, in my opinion, also was not uh, well thought out. Uh, Pakistan has had longstanding uh, relations, uh, both military and economic, with Ukraine. Uh, they were far more significant uh, than our relationship uh, with Russia. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, Pakistan's foreign policy has always uh, prided itself for standing on principle. So when you stand on principle, then you've got to call a spade a spade. An invasion is an invasion. Uh, and an aggression is an aggression. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think uh, the pushback when I made this case to friends and family was that, you know, well, what about Iraq in 2003? And I was like, that was wrong as well. And that does not mean um, that, you know, if, if one, two wrongs don't make a right, but somehow that was also lost in the discourse uh, within Pakistan or the way Pakistanis were talking about uh, the invasion in Ukraine. Um, and I think, yes, we prided ourselves as Pakistanis on standing with international law, and that should be the approach. And there should be clarity um, in, in, in doing that, as you said, calling a spade a spade. Um, last few minutes, Dr. Lodi, um, from, from your perspective, obviously, this government uh, has a short stint, but Pakistan's foreign policy challenges and the environment in which it operates is it, it remains challenging. Of course, we're heading towards a US-China strategic competition that is only going to stiffen in the coming weeks and months. And there's a multipolar world emerging, right? And that hasn't happened in, in decades in, in sort of global geopolitics. What are some risks that you see um, down the horizon that perhaps Pakistani policymakers, Pakistani citizens, um, those with an interest in foreign policy should think about and, and start uh, planning for, given the, the rapid pace at which the world is changing? I think, Ozer, if I can just uh, go back a little and just uh, you know sum up some of the things that I had said earlier, maybe just bring them all different strands together. I think the five key areas that will remain the focus of Pakistan's foreign policy will, will be relations with China, the United States, um, as we were discussing, navigating this Sino-US uh, confrontation. Then uh, what we've not talked about, and I think that's where the risk uh, comes from, dealing with Afghanistan's uncertainties. Uh, then the other area of risk, managing uh, the adversarial relationship with India. And of course, you know, I, we've all, already spoken a bit about balancing ties between strategic allies, Saudi Arabia and neighbor Iran. But I think uh, the risk factors are really in the region. Uh, Afghanistan, um, you know, Pakistan has to manage different dimensions uh, of its uh, relations with the Taliban government and its security concerns have been growing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the TTP's actions. I mean, you spoke about um, BLA, uh, Baloch uh, uh, group's actions. Uh, there seems to be some evidence to indicate that there is, at least at the tactical level, cooperation between, between the Baloch uh, you know, groups and the TTP, which is, you know, sounds uh, incredibly, uh, you know, it sounds incredibly strange, um, but that is su supposedly something that is happening on the border. Um, and the TTP has also kind of expanded its area of operation beyond KP into, into Balochistan. So what we're looking at uh, is a situation where Pakistan has been trying to push the Taliban uh, to take action, to contain uh, the TTP, uh, so, you know, that is an area uh, I think we have to keep watching very closely uh, our border uh, problems uh, with, uh, with the Taliban government, with the, with, the Afghan, with the Taliban run Afghanistan, I should say. The other, of course, is uh, India, which we haven't uh, talked about. Now, you know, that will remain, remain a major preoccupation uh, and a difficult challenge because, as you know, the Modi government has, you know, continued its repressive policy. Uh, in occupied Kashmir and sort of pressing ahead with demographic changes there, which, you know, rejecting Pakistan's protests. Uh, so, you know, there was a chance uh, in the back channel communication that was established a couple of years ago and then carried on uh, for some time that this might yield some kind of a mechanism by which the two countries can at least manage tensions. And perhaps then that in turn would lead to or pave the way for some kind of a dialogue, a proper dialogue. But that didn't happen. Uh, what, what we did get was an agreement between the two countries to observe a ceasefire uh, on the line of control. And that was important. One shouldn't uh, minimize 
But this, uh, you know, front, the Eastern Front will remain uh, an area of risk and an area that Pakistan will have to very, you know, deftly uh, manage uh, because, uh, you know, Kashmir will remain uh, uh, an issue of, uh, of pivotal importance in Pakistan's foreign policy. So, you know, it has to continue to somehow maintain its principal position on Kashmir, but at the same time manage tensions uh, with India, uh, even though I think, you know, the very word normalization uh, seems so such a remote possibility uh, that I can't even use that. I mean, I think that's really far off. So, you know, the, the, the risk is on the geopolitical front, the risk comes from the region. But I think in, in a broader sense, the risk really is within uh, the economic uh, return to the economic crisis. Uh, unless we are able to you know, manage this, address it, uh, and not address it in a Band-Aid way, uh, which is what we've been doing for the last, I don't know how many decades, but address it on a sustainable basis, uh, you know, everything else is in vain. Uh, you know, we just agreed, Ozer, that foreign policy begins at home, but foreign an effective foreign policy also rests on a strong domestic base. Uh, when the domestic base is afflicted by political turmoil and economic trouble, uh, then naturally it, it is going to uh, cast a shadow on our foreign policy efforts. I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, um, you know, as you were describing the challenges on both the Eastern and Western flanks, my mind kept going back to the fact that if you don't have political stability within and economic stability within, um, your country just can't, you know, afford, for example, the types of action needed on the Western front to deal with the rising terror terrorism threat, which I refer to continuously as Pakistan's second war on terror. And on the eastern side, it gives a more aggressive, more belligerent India, um, you know, less sort of, a, you know, it doesn't concern them as much because they're like, hey, they're, they're struggling at home. So we can continue with our policy because there's just no way they're going to be able to push back economically, internationally for various reasons. And they're too preoccupied with their own challenges. And I think, um, you know, we chatted briefly about this. Uh, uh, offline before before this interview about the fact that to me at least um, this internal crisis in Pakistan economically politically is perhaps the most serious that my reading or very short reading of history uh, suggests it's more serious than uh, more serious since 1971 and we need to get out of this um, and reform our political economy because without that um, the complex task of navigating a multipolar uh, world, the complex task of navigating the challenges within the neighborhood um, and really meeting the potential um, and, and promise that, you know, many Pakistanis hold, young Pakistanis hold, it's not going to happen unless we get our own house in order. And I think that perhaps is the most important task uh, for Pakistan's policymakers and its elites for the next three, four, five years at the very least. Exactly. Uzair, I mean, unless you empower yourself uh, internally, I think uh, the rest will remain sort of, uh, you know, overshadowed by your internal problems or, you know, a lack of political and economic stability. So, you know, I'm, I'm as, as a foreign policy person, uh, I can't help but uh, say to those of my colleagues, both former and some at present, that somehow, you know, sometimes, not somehow, but sometimes, you know, foreign policy is pursued kind of disconnected from the situation at home. Uh, and that's not uh, sustainable. Uh, and it just doesn't work. Yeah, and I think hopefully things will turn around and one can be optimistic that, you know, people will find some level of uh, stability within and domestically with despite all the disagreements we as a society have. And I think um, my view at least is that you know, staying within the bounds of the constitution and, and fighting it out within those bounds is all okay, but let's let's try to bring our own house in order. But Dr. Lodi, this has been a fantastic conversation. Again, thank you so much for taking out the time. Um, I wish we had more time to dive deeper into some of the other questions I did have, 
Uh, but perhaps we'll have you, uh, you know, join us again in the near future to talk about those in depth. And then when there's more clarity on the direction uh, with the IMF, with Saudi Arabia, with China, et cetera, uh, to get a sense of where Pakistan goes next. But again, I think you've, you've, you've nailed uh, the, the, the question uh, with the line that foreign policy begins at home, and I couldn't agree more. So thank you for your time and, and for joining us today. Thank you, Zair. I always uh, follow what you say and do, and your questions were super. So I didn't have a choice but to try to live up to the quality of your questions. So thank you for having me. That means a lot. Thank you for the kind feedback for the office. The office.